Welcome to the Swim Swim Breakdown. As always, I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, coming to you from Austin, Texas. We're joined by senior international reporter Loretta Race from Kentucky and Swim Swim writer Yin Yin Lee from Madison, New Jersey. What's up, y'all? It's a lot, a lot of swimming this weekend. Yes. And yes. we're about to dive into <laughs> all of it. Uh, we we had a week off on the Swim Swim Breakdown. A lot of the commenters were exceedingly upset. So <laughs> happy to be back in the saddle and let's get right into it. We saw two surprise world records. Um, our editor in chief, who will be rejoining us um, soon on the breakdown, said that these weren't so surprising, but I'm curious what you think about them. Tomorrow, Honda 146.85 in the 200 meter fly on the men's side. And then Lee being she 351, was it 40? 30? It was like three fifty one, three nine, I believe. Okay, and the four hundred, and in the, the four hundred yeah. short course freestyle. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on these. Which one was more surprising to you, and why, uh, Loretta? I want to start with you. Sure. Um, for me, it wasn't so much that these records were broken; it was just that they were smashed. You know, by it wasn't tense; it was you know over a second in tomorrow Honda's case. Um, and for me, it's, it's, it was a little surprising because um, he's not going to short course world championships. So this, he broke it at the actual Japanese short course championship meet. Um, and so you would think, okay, he's fully tapered and, you know, this is what's going to happen for him to get on the team. And then he bypasses that because he's going back to school. So I guess it's not a surprise in the sense that he was fully rested because this was his championship meet. It was just the fact that he beat it by over a second. And he, I mean, no one's been under 147, you know, in, in, or under 148. Diet uh, Seto's record was 148. What was it? 65, 24. So mm-hmm. the fact that he just beat it by so much was surprising to me. I kind of find it funny how like anticlimactic both world records were. Like they were both broken by like a significant margin. But for most people, at least like in the US, it was like, oh, you wake up and you check swim swim. Oh, there's a world record and it was broken by two seconds. Okay, time to move on with my day. And I just find that really funny. And I think it sort of says something about how like just like how short course like isn't taken like as seriously where because like in long course you typically see world records being broken at like big championship meets whereas like short course records it's like they just like happen like out of nowhere like at like a national championship meet like not at short course worlds but I think um Honda's was a little more surprising to me than Li Bingjie's because um Li Bingjing because Li I feel like she had a lot of momentum coming into this year. Like she went 401 um, at the Olympics, long course, and then she won two world titles at short course worlds, but China was really hard hit by COVID at worlds. So um, kind of like forgot about her. And I also think that the 400 free record as show- said in Braden's article that it was bound to be broken. And the previous one was like relatively weak come in comparison to other short course records whereas I feel like Honda's world record was more out of nowhere and I feel like he didn't really have that much momentum as Lee did coming into um his swim I wouldn't say it's out of nowhere I mean he has the Olympic silver medalist so he yeah. he has that kind of precedent behind him I think in both cases they both Japanese and Chinese swimmers really perform at their best domestically so I think that that isn't that big of a surprise that they would lay down their best times, you know, at a domestic meet, because I think historically that's what's happened. And Australia kind of used to be in the same boat and they've kind of branched out a little bit. But I, I think it's just, you know, the fact that Honda has arrived, I, I think he's kind of, pr- this is another, you know, piece of evidence that the silver medal wasn't a fluke, you know, so I think he's, and I'm really disappointed he's not going to be in Melbourne, you know, because I think that who's to say you couldn't drop even more time at that meet? You know, I, I think that that would be really, really fun to watch. To me, the biggest takeaway I got from Honda's world record is that like, is this a sign that maybe someone could be challenging Christoph Milak in the future? Cause Milak isn't going to be dominant forever. And just like with Ledecky and how she was dominant 
in the 400 free and she pushed Titmus to be at her level. I wonder if that's going to happen with Milok and Honda now that Honda's kind of shown that like he can break world records as well. Like I wonder if that's going to translate into long course. I hope so. <laughs> I wonder if it, I mean he certainly said it motivated him moving into Paris, right? Yeah. Uh in that event specifically and maybe this will inspire Christophe Milok to take yeah. short course seriously. Although I highly doubt that. Yeah. Um, his long course personal <laughs> best is faster than his short course personal best, I believe, which is kind of funny. Yes. <laughs> it is really interesting that, as Loretta mentioned, there's a home court advantage for both swims. Both swims were at their country's national championships, short course national championships. Um, but then it's also kind of a case of, like Braden mentioned in his article, w- were these world records soft to begin with? Do do uh, swimmers internationally just not put enough emphasis or as much emphasis into short course? Um, I think that makes this p- time of the season really exciting because you have World Cups, you have national championships all in short course um, where we kind of get to switch the focus off of Olympic or World Championship swimming and now kind of get to a different lens where uh, we don't really know what the boundaries are or what the right. limitations of a lot of these swims yeah. are. Um, I think I think that another reason why these world records are being set at the national championships is we have to remember that the Asian games were canceled this year. And I think that's that was like the big meat for Asian swimmers, like Euros and Commonwealths. And now that they don't really have that, like nationals is sort of like their big fall summer meet where they get to like go all out. So speaking of other national championships, we saw Beta Nelson just light it up at the Berlin World Cup. She was, uh, I think, second or third overall in scoring. Um, got that ten thousand dollar check uh, <clears throat> for the U.S. Does this signify to you that we need to start having a short course national championships to select our short course worlds team? I think it definitely does. I mean, like we see, I I pointed this out in a tweet a few weeks ago, like we see Australia doing it. We see China doing it. We see Japan doing it. Like, why can't we do it? Like, especially like, I think the US, like with the emphasis being placed on yard swimming, I feel like you get more of these so-called short course specialists out of the United States than you do in other countries where maybe short course swimming isn't as prevalent. And it just bothers me to see like Bita Nelson and Coleman Stewart. And I'm going to sound like a broken record because people have been talking about this for ages, like just being left off of short course teams and not getting international racing opportunities because the selection is based off long course times. And I think a short course national championships would be a really easy way to solve that. I feel like I don't really have to go further. (laughs) I mean, for me, I think it's more a a determinant factor of who wants to compete at short course worlds. You know, I think having a trials would put the people who actually want to vie for a roster spot, you know, in the mix. So I think if you just don't think you're going to compete or don't want to compete at short course worlds, you wouldn't compete at the trials because we were looking at, okay, was, was Beta being left off a snub, you know, who else maybe potentially, could have been on the roster. And I was looking at the criteria and like, I don't understand why Ryan held wasn't put on the roster. Like, I don't know if I'm misinterpreting the rules. I think maybe he chose not to go because I think he would have been. Anyways. Okay, cool. So, so like Brooks Curry, you know, Caleb Dressel, those people were not on the roster. And so I was like, well, held is kind of next in line with this 15,100 and he took silver medals last year in Abu Dhabi. So I think just having it be clear, cut, and dry, if you want to compete at Short Curse World Championships, here are the trials and the top two where the people under this time can, you know, cut, make it just like we said other nations do. And I think it's it's just makes it more like, you know, a clear pathway to get to that roster if that's what your goal is. And then you just simply opt out of the trials if you don't foresee competing there. And I understand from the U.S.'s perspective that short course is just not as big of a priority. And by putting the emphasis on long course and perhaps giving that long course national team more international racing experience, you are fostering 
the potential world and Olympic championship medalists in long course. It's worked out for the U S in the past, certainly. Uh, but I don't agree with it, especially with the world cup being right here. It's like, why not have, have the selection, uh, intermingle with the world cup results it, at the very least, right? If you're not going to have a trials, at least say, okay, if you make a cuts at the world cup, then you can have at least some kind of priority, or you can have a chance to be selected for this roster. I can agree with that. The yeah, only thing I is that like world cup would work. I think so, but it's also some of these athletes would have to pay their own way to even get there. And so some athletes who could potentially, you know, make the grade would that whole world cup would be out of their realm of possibility in terms of qualification made mm-hmm. simply because they physically can't get there. You know what I mean? So I think that mm-hmm. that is another kind of, no offense, strike against your idea, Coleman. <laughs> well, especially this year though, because the, because two of the stops are in North America, right? It's like, true. we would have a trials meet in Indy anyway. That's in true. Theory. That's true. This um, year. You know, yes. So they, yeah, this year it could have been a different situation, but you're right. Like typically world cups are uh, mostly in Europe and Asia, which much more expensive to get to for mm-hmm. anyone in the U S uh, than Indy is moving on. We did see a lot more amazing swims <clears throat> at the world cups. Um, one standout was Dylan Carter who took three wins in the 50 fly, the 50 back and the 50 free all three events. He won over Olympic champions. Um, among uh, uh, among other very highly rated and status swimmers. Which 50 was most impressive to you? Which 50 stood out of Dylan's three victories in Berlin? So for me, I feel like this guy on the cusp, you know, of making a name is like right there. So I think this is really his breakout meet, the fact that he was able to top the podium three times after so many close calls. So the 50 free, the fact that he beat both Florent Manandu and Kyle Chalmers of Australia is huge from just like an ego boosting point of view. I mean, Kyle won last World Cup season three out of four 50 freestyles. So it's not like he's going against someone who maybe touched the wall first once. So, you know, he's going against like essentially the reigning World Cup champion in the 50 free. And he also did it with a huge PB. He was never under the 21 second threshold before. And he totally dipped beneath that with the 27-7. And in doing so, he broke George Bavel's long-standing record. I think it was like a decade old. You know, so the fact that he's rewriting his own nation's history, you know, and he's only 26, you know, that's that's a really prime age for male sprinters. So he might just be kind of scratching the tip of the iceberg, you know, with the swim, I think. Yeah, I'm going to go with the 50 free as well, but because I feel like he's already like really good at the 50 fly that's like his main event so it's like him going fast in the 50 fly sort of expected but the 50 free at least it's not an event that is like his main event like the 50 fly and um i agree with what loretta said about how he beat manadu and chalmers who are both really big short course good short course um 50 freestyles and and also like how much he dropped like getting under the 21 second barrier for the first time moving up into the all-time top 25 I think that's another big thing and yeah I'm gonna go with 50 free as well I really I mean the 50 free what a field to top um but the 50 back was just a little more surprising to me just because um while Florent and Kyle are obviously big name swimmers um, so especially Florent, I think we've seen him be a little off of his top game, uh, most recently Kyle, he, he can swim fast, very consistently, but the 50, not totally his event. Um, but Thomas Chacon is coming off a red hot summer where he broke the world record. I thought he'd be, you know, he's young, like early twenties, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought he'd be a, a little more speedy here and he did swim quite a few events in Berlin, but to top the the guy who just broke the hundred back world record to me was like, okay, Dylan Carter, he is here to play, <laughs> uh, which talking to his, one of his former coaches, David Marsh um, this week, you know, David said, I, I had seen glimpses of this and like Dylan was kind of always right there in training. Like he would do something and just be like, Whoa, 
okay, like <laughs> th- there it is, but but he wasn't uh, necessarily super consistent with that. And so I, th- I think David's like, you know, obviously he has found something now to where he's elevated, whether that is training wise or just motivation. Like he said, you know, getting fourth three times this summer mm-hmm. um, between yeah. world champs and Commonwealth games. It's like, he's, he's obviously leveled up in some way and pretty, pretty cool to see uh, more big surprises at, at in Berlin. Um, Rudimel Utite <laughs> almost breaks a world record after her comeback season, Chad LeClo 2.0, as we've deemed him, uh, you know, he, he's been to therapy. He's got a new coach, uh, and he seems to be back in great form. Which one was more impressive to you? Ruda's swims or Chad's swims? I'm going to have to go with Chad. I mean, I love this dude being 30 years old and he's putting up his best times in two years. And I feel like he just does his own thing. Like, okay, so so yeah, he's faced his mental health demons. He's, he's gotten the therapy he needs and he's in progress of that, but you know, he changed coaches to Sonny and now to Dirk in Germany. And so I feel like he truly just does what he wants to do. And like, we always say, why are you looking to the sky when you're swimming fly? Like still does it, you know what I mean? So it's like, he just says nay, you know, to, to everyone who's kind of like chipping away at, you know, what he does and just continues to go down his own path. And now it's coming to fruition. I mean, I think this again is just kind of the opening scene to potentially what could transpire on the road to Paris 2024. But I think the confidence, like he said in his interview post race, I didn't even care what the time was. I just wanted to win bad. So I think the fact that he was able to get his hand on the wall first is just he set out, you know, to do what he wanted to do. He, he made that happen. And I, I, I'm really happy for him, actually. I really am. Yeah, I'm going to say that Chad's was a bigger Chad's performances were a bigger surprise to me as well because I feel like Ruda was right there in the long course like she almost broke the 50 breast world record long course this summer at Euros and it's not surprising that she's doing it again in short course but Chad I remember a few weeks ago on the podcast um we were discussing like if he would medal again internationally and everyone was like really skeptical and like even when I was writing his interview um about seeing therapy and his like he was saying like oh my goal for Paris is <clears throat> gold on the new Chad and like I know he he can like say that but I was still like a little skeptical just because he's like a lot older now and I didn't really like see like what what he had in him but like, like after seeing him show up and perform I'm like maybe like this whole thing about like this new reinvented Chad, like maybe he, he like actually has something to back up with that. And I was just like surprised that he would get back into the swing of things so quickly. I I can't say I'm ever surprised when Chad swims really fast Uh, because (laughs) especially short course, because he's just so good at it. Right. I mean, he, he has been for the last decade. I mean, he's, one of the one of the most if not the most winningest man in world cup history you know so like no matter what he's going through like it it doesn't surprise me too much if if he you know just poops out a 200 fly win at a world cup because it's like because that's what he's done for the last 10 years you know um so like i'm super happy to see chad back on top. I like it. I think it's awesome, but I think Ruda was more of a surprise to me just because of her trajectory in the last year and a half. You know, it's like, she took that big break. She finally came back to swimming and then it was like worlds, boom, medals, mm-hmm. euros, boom, medals close to the world record. And then like, doesn't even miss a beat, uh, going into the world cup. I think maybe not this swim in particular, but just, her last uh, six months is is the more surprising thing to me because it's like she's she's right uh, right on she's going best times right mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. after taking year and a half two years uh, away from competition and so it's like yeah go Ruda um, <laughs> but I gotta go with that one that was Berlin uh, <laughs> moving on to swimming stateside we saw a lot of college <laughs> action. We're going to start off with uh, the meet. I was lucky enough to attend UVA versus UF. Virginia raised their 2022 championship banner for the women. Uh, at this dual meet, there was some 
fast swims. Um, Loretta, let's start with you. What was your standout swim uh, for Virginia versus Florida? I know I'm becoming more and more of a college fan (laughs) because there's so much fast swimming, like every meet. It's like, I feel like we're kind of early in the season, but it doesn't matter. I feel like every meet there's going to be something amazing happening. So for me, it was Gretchen Walsh. Okay. Getting under the A cut in the hundred fly fastest non-suited time ever 50.53. So for me that I, it was immediately eye catching like, what the heck is going on here? It would have been fifth at last year's NCAAs. And I don't even think she swam it last year, you know? So I just feel like that. I'd not swim it this year. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't think she's so, gonna swim it this year either. That's the thing. I mean, it's it's that's what's scary about these true talent people that just, I mean, like you said, can just throw like Chad, throw out a swim and it might not even be their primary event, and all of a sudden they're like among the best ever. So for me, I was like, wow, I stopped Red Union's article, you know, that was huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously Gretchen was very impressive. I feel like that's the clear like flat out answer but I think I was pretty impressed by the UVA men even though they lost to Florida I thought Matt King and Noah Nichols really stood out like Noah Nichols went 52-2 I believe in the 100 breasts and that's faster than he was at mid-seasons and I remember Noah had a really big freshman year he dropped a lot of time but he wasn't able to get back to those times sophomore year and just like him going really fast at his first dual meet of the season I think bodes really well and if he can maybe like go back to his like freshman times or like even get faster I think that could be really good for UVA just like having another potential a finalist and Matt King as well he went 40 to four which is also faster than he was at mid seasons and he's coming off obviously like a great summer and i think he has a lot of momentum and that's going to translate into where he's at in the college season and honestly like if he pops like a 41 at like mid seasons and continues this trajectory i honestly see him getting into the conversation of like who's going to win the 100 free NCAA title. I think he can really move himself up there. And I just was like really impressed because like we see the Virginia woman like going fast in season all the time, but I feel like the men don't get as many headlines about that. And I just thought like they really stood out to me. Yeah. And that has to be my answer too. I mean, obviously Gretchen's 21, nine 50 flies like, okay, that's, that's crazy. But at the time, like we didn't even realize that I didn't realize it was that fast until Yinyan texted me and was like, uh, the splits are weird, but she actually go 21, nine. And I was like, no. And then I was like, Todd, what did Gretchen go? He's like, she actually went 21, nine. I was like, what? <laughs> um, that was crazy. But the relays on the men's side are what really stood out to me. Like, even though Virginia men, the a relay, uh, ultimately DQ'd in the two medley, they were 124, which is like 124.5, I think, which is insane for an in-season dual meet in Speedos. You know, it's like you win NCAA is going 121. So it's like, it's not that much faster. And then um, the 400 free relays, both on the men's and the women's, uh, they were both pool records. The women went 311, which again is like an NCAA time. You know, you're you're averaging 40 under 47 or sorry under 48 0 um and then on the men's side 252 for florida um which is also i think what the indiana men went at the tri meet that we'll talk about in a sec but uh <clears throat> dual meets are just getting faster the, yeah. this season has really raised the bar um because again for two going 252 you have at least two guys going 42 on your relay which in season is kind of unheard of, uh, before this year. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, the Florida men had a lot of momentum in that, but those really stood out to me as just kind of, just kind of boating for what we have to look forward to the rest of the season. Um, Coleman, were you sitting next to Todd the Sorbo the entire time at the meet? Uh, no, I know he was brief. (laughs) I know he was briefly mic'd up for that relay. (laughs) He was mic'd up. Um, I was filming and then they had to cut part it, of it. He was probably too ecstatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I noticed. 
we had to cut parts of it uh as <laughs> as the lights on as i'm sure uh <laughs> yeah he was just upset because everything in their pool was breaking <laughs> ouch yeah <laughs> they had like a timing pad issue they had like a lane line something they had yeah, lights there. yeah like eh, nothing was going right yeah <laughs> When I was doing the live recap, I spilled oatmeal on my laptop while doing the live recap. So at home, things were malfunctioning as well. And so you I was started like, started it and it yeah. spread. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was like several events behind. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a chaotic event, but overall, lots of fast swimming. Yeah. Um, and then in Austin, the day before, we had Texas, Texas AM and IU Tri Meet. Uh, give me your top swims from that one, because I, I would say no historic swims, but but equally as impressive for an in-season dual meet. I'm going to go with Kelly Pash's swims in the 100 free and 200 free. Um, just like he, she went 48-1 in the 100 free, 145-8 in the 200 free. And obviously, like after seeing people like Gretchen Walsh and Maggie McNeil, dropping like 47 lows and all that like it doesn't <clears throat> seem as impressive but like 48 one is still a really good unsuited time for a dual meet and it's like just off scoring at ncaa's and being able to do that in i think her second meet of season i think that that's really impressive and i think it w also would have matched gabby albiro's times i think she went 41 at the SMU invite and that was suited and also um the 145 8 200 free I think she's the first to get under 146 this season and her time was like right on what Alex Walsh and Ella Nelson went at the UVA floor of me and I just think those swims really stood out to me on the woman's side uh, for me I was going with you know Brendan Burns on um, the IU just pulling the two fly two back double over Carson Foster. I love making some Carson Foster Cincinnati boy. So I'm always like high alert, you know, when Carson swims, <laughs> but Brendan Burns, I mean, really that's such a confidence boost. He now owns the number one and the number two times, um, you know, in the NCAA for the, for the two fly and the two back. So I think at this point in the season, I think that's just a huge confidence boost that you beat someone who meddled, you know, internationally for the U USA. So I think, those were my swims. Yeah, that that those were really surprising to me that uh, Burns was able to get the job done in both of those events. I mean, we know he has crazy good underwaters. He's obviously the defending champ in the two fly coming into the season, but that that, that was uh, pretty great to see. Um, my biggest surprise from this meet was actually kind of on the flip side. Um, we saw Baylor Nelson have a really great meet at the <clears throat> SMU Classic. I'm assuming he was suited for that, but I think he was 134 in the 200 free. I think he was 142 or 143 in the 200 IM. Um, he put up some just some really competitive times, 156, I want to say, in the 200 breast. Um, and then he kind of came here. And I think he was, he was not as good. Uh, he was... <laughs> 138 in the 200 free. Uh, did he swim the 200 breast? He did not. And then the 200 IM, he was 148. So he he added some significant time and it doesn't worry me at all, but I, I was a little surprised at, at, at the at the stark contrast from um, a, a suited meet versus an unsuited meet. And He's a freshman. I think he's going to figure it out. I think he's going to do great things for a &M. But that kind of stood out to me as like, oh, okay. We're, we're still figuring things out. Um, Coleman, the commenters are going to come at you because you're not supposed to be taking anything away from dual mates because they're not tapered. And if you're not tapered, nothing matters. Um, I think that's the point of dual meets. If you ask any <laughs> swim coach is, is to learn. These are learning experiences and we're just gathering information for the final thing. Yes, but commenters are not logical. You have to remember that. Yeah, they, yeah. yeah. Commenters are not swim coaches. Actually, yeah. that's probably untrue. Many of them. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the bulk of them are. Exposed. The bulk of them are. <laughs> yeah, it's a good chunk of them. Okay, ASU dueled Wisconsin. We saw some really fast swims there, but we're not talking about the college side of that one. We are talking about the post grad side. Simone Manuel, uh, in particular. 
22-1 in the 50-yard free, 48-4 in the 100-yard freestyle. Her first yard swims in four-plus years. What does this signal to you about where Simone is in her training okay, so with Bob Bowman? Before we start talking about this, I just want to know, did you guys see the video of ASU like drawing a Wisconsin bus and stopping on the Wisconsin bus before the meet? Because that's the only reason why I remember that they swim against Wisconsin. <laughs> Okay. I did not. I think Herbie posted it. But going back to Simone, um, <laughs> for me, I don't know. Like, that's the big question. It's like, I don't want to read too much. Okay, these obviously were not our best times and we wouldn't expect them to be. So were they just kind of like, you know, dabbling type swims? Like, was she going hardcore? Like, who knows? And, but it's just such a, di- a difference between short course yards and then long course meters. So, you know, to to think, okay, is this going to open the door for some like monumental performance at the U.S. Open? I don't know. I I, I just don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I'm thinking positively, you know, I'm thinking that, okay, this is her just kind of testing the waters and like seeing where her training's at. And then she'll kind of, you know, not blow up, but, you know, kind of get back to like old Simone. That's kind of what I'm hoping, but I, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, for me, it's like the times weren't super groundbreaking, but 22-1, 20, 48 for decent times and maybe not by Simone standards, but we have to remember this is her first time doing any like official racing in well over a year. And I just don't think her times from this are really any indication of what she'll be like at US Open, at trials. I think it's just a way of like getting back into the water and it it may be if she went like a 24 like I would be concerned but her times are decent for any swimmer and I just don't think they really say anything I think the fact that she's racing says that she's in a place where she can race again Um, obviously after the Olympics she had to take some time out of the pool take some time off we know she's been training but just to see her race again, honestly, regardless of the times, I think that's a very positive sign. Uh, Simone has always been a really good in-season swimmer, so I think she will go to U.S. Open and kind of make a statement swims. Like I would not be surprised to see her go 24 and 53 at U.S. Open. Um, Whoa. I, I feel like that's, that, reasonable. that's reasonable. That's my <laughs> prediction. Um, because those are like, those are pretty consistent in season yeah. swims for Simone. And I think if she could hit those times, that kind of be like, all right, expletive, I'm back. So that's, that's my takeaway. I think it's great that she's racing again. And I think Agreed. at this point in October, that's all we need from Simone. All right. We are going to end our new segment uh, of this week's breakdown with your favorite commit from this week of the class of 2024 we had quite a few big ones uh so just give me your favorite off the top of your head (laughs) i'm gonna go with anna mosh to uva totally not because she's from new jersey but um yeah i think because she's in a recruiting class with world championship medalist Leah Hayes and Olympian Katie Grimes like she was kind of I guess like overlooked but I think she was a very high profile recruit best sprinter in the class so definitely the highest relay value and I was looking at her times and I they're like right around what Gretchen Walsh went in her sophomore year and of high school and like we obviously know where Gretchen Walsh is right now and I wonder if they like recruited her by saying oh like you're going to be the next Gretchen Walsh and I just think this is a really big and I think this is the biggest commitment that UVA has gotten like since Kate Douglas, Gretchen Walsh, Alex Walsh, the people and it's and I honestly think like they like Virginia already has Bailey Hartman, Katie Christopherson Christopher Cern, and now that they have most they're making a pretty good case for themselves to have the top recruiting class of 2024. Kutsi slash Tetsi slash however you want to pronounce his name from South Africa going to Cal super stoked for this kid okay he's 
steadily been going up, you know, the mountain of backstroke. And I think the fact that he's going to Cal, you know, home of Ryan Murphy and et cetera, other backstroking gods. I think this is just phenomenal. And I'm super, super stoked for him. I I think this is the most intriguing commit for so many reasons. He's not going to be there for another year, right? Because he's staying right. with his coach to train for the Olympics. Is he going to come in at semester in January and pull a Matt no, Sates? He's coming in fall. I asked him when I wrote the article. So okay, yeah, no Matt. He Sates. says that now. I was a about lot to say, of time. And doing. No. No. I'm going to be very <laughs> upset. A lot, lot of time Sates. between then and now. <laughs> Uh, you know, Sate said he was going to stay there. Yes. He, he stayed for three months <laughs> and then peace. Uh, there were rumors that Sates was like going to come back to the NCAA at some and to point. Cal. Like this... I heard someone say he was going to Cal, which is where Peter went. So yeah. That so <laughs> yeah, I, I just think there's so many possible ways this could play out. Um, <laughs> yes. But it's very intriguing to see. Yeah. A kid who, as you said, is, is just going up and up and up. Um, it seems like things are going well for him in South Africa, but to see him commit to college, like, you know, I, I think aside from David Popovich, like he might be um, one of the premier younger talents on the men's side internationally and now he's committed to the ncaa so we'll see how that goes <laughs> if it does <laughs> if it does <laughs> uh and with that let's play our favorite game sink or swim first up today on sink or swim sports pro put out their annual list of most marketable athletes in 2022 and two swimmers cracked their top 100 katie ledecky and adam Peaty. it is worth noting that this is solely a huge pr thing and that i don't i don't know how much credibility you can actually give this list but in your eyes are Katie Ledecky and Adam Peaty the two most marketable swimmers in swimming for 2022? For me, I see Katie Ledecky, okay? There's a gazillion memes out there of her, like, lapping people. You know, her name's been on the Olympics. Obviously, she's medaled multiple, multiple times. I did a Wall Street Journal crossword puzzle. She was one of the clues. You know, she's infiltrated popular culture. Petey, I agree. Okay. He, I feel like he does a very good job marketing himself. Like he puts that project immortal out there. He was on Strictly Come Dancing. He did this whole announcement of me and my girlfriend broke up. So I, I feel like he kind of inserts himself more than like, I don't know. It's, it's generated from like his swims. I don't know. So I'm sinking Petey. I'm swimming Ledecky, bottom line. <laughs> I mean, to go off what Loretta said, I think marketability comes from two things. One, you're good. And second, well, like you're good on an Olympic level. And people know about you. And second, it's like personality. Like I think Ledecky is marketable in a sense where she's good and she's dominant. And everyone knows about her. But I also think she's a little more on the introverted side of things. So Maybe like in that regards, like like I'm not criticizing her personality. I'm just saying like she's introverted and like I feel like she's not the type to like actively like put herself out there like with the media. And I think PD, I actually am the opposite of Loretta. I think PD is really marketable because just because like he's dominant, he has both of those factors. He's very dominant um in swimming, but he's also like doing all sorts of other things like he was on that dance show and he's like saying like project immortal and all that he wrote his own book and I think just on the commercial side and the swimming side he's doing a lot and so I think he is pretty marketable but uh, this is nothing against Ledecky I'm just saying just like different personalities yeah <clears throat> I mean I I would say even after the year that they both had I think Caleb Dressel is still the the, yeah. t the most He's marketable the, the top marketable athlete. I mean, even though he pulled out of world championships and had no media whatsoever, like you could still sell that guy anywhere and people would yeah. buy. Um, yeah. He still won two world titles, you know, which is uh, 
which is more than Adam Peaty won <laughs> this year. <clears throat> so I, I, I'm thinking that as well. Um, I, I do not, I would not go so far as to say Petey and Ledecky are the top two in swimming. Uh, next up, Cameron Craig, who has swam at, had stints at Arizona State, uh, Ohio State, has now surfaced at Drury University uh, in Springfield, Missouri, uh, which is D2, by the way, if you didn't know that. Uh, I'm curious to know if you think that Drury will win a national title, either individual, relay, or team this year with the addition of Cameron Craig. I mean, I feel like it's pretty obvious that they will because last year Queens won and they were second on the men's side and now Queens is in D1. So, and they, I'm pretty sure they were like a hundred points separated from the third place finisher and just having Craig there will like boost their chances even more. Like, come on, like, even if he's not at his peak, he went 41-9 in the hundred free 131 7 in the 200 free and i feel like both of those times are sort of a lock to win on d2 stage and he just seems like he's having a healthier relationship with the sport and just with life in general i know he got into like legal trouble in the past and i just feel like he's back on the right track and with queens leaving and jury getting this addition i think definitely they're gonna win the ncaa title at least on the men's side yeah, I'm swimming it too. I think only because Queens is leaving because Queens had such depth. I mean, I think they scored points like every men's event and I think they won almost every relay. Maybe they did win every men's relay. So the fact that they're leaving and Drury, I think they were fewer than 100 points behind them. So I think that that sets them up for a team title. And Cameron, I honestly wonder if he even, not like doesn't care, but like, I think he's just swimming, you know, and seeing how it goes and like, just kind of like, doing it because he loves the sport rather than like gunning for titles or gunning for anything. So I think that he's in a good place mentally. Um, and I think that's only going to help him be a better teammate. So I, I'm interested, actually. I, I really think it's going to happen for Drury. Well, I, I'm swimming it. I have a dog in this fight because Drury's sprint coach, Zach Mertens, was my high school teammate in swimming oh. and we graduated together. <clears throat> so... I believe in what Zach can do. He uh, trained Carol Ostrowski when he was at Drury um, to NCAA titles there. And I think he can do the same with Cameron Craig, whether that is the team title overall or just a sprint relay or two. So cool. it's a swim for me. <laughs> Next up, Summer McIntosh is now training full time with Brent Arkey and the Sarasota Sharks in Sarasota, Florida. Do you sink or swim this move uh, for summer? You know, she was training with Canadian pros, just the best of the best in the country under Ben Titley. And now uh, she's swimming with a high school club program. You know, how do you see this playing out for summer? Is it a sink or a swim for you? I mean, I'm swimming it because she she obviously is natural talent. So it's not like that's going to die, you know, be because of where she's training. And I'm sure she and her parents carefully weighed all the pros and cons, you know, all the, the you know, cost benefit analysis of, of a physical move, a coach move, you know, everything else. So I even mean, she's young enough where she's still kind of feeling out, you know, what events are going to be her primary events, you know, what she's going to contest in Paris. So I feel like she's doing what's best for her and her family. And I I. I'm swimming it. Yeah, I'm going to swim it as well because I just feel like there wasn't that much she could do in the time because at the High Performance Center, a lot of people are leaving. Yuri Kissel left, Josh Lando's at Florida, Maggie McNeil's at LSU, Moss is in Spain with Ben Titley. And this is nothing against Ryan Millet. I'm sure he's a good I coach. I was in the Philippines. Just... Oh, yeah, yeah. And that just... Yeah. When, because Coleman, you say like she's going to be training with high schoolers instead of Canadian pros, but when all the Canadian pros are gone, the Canadian pros at her level are gone, there really isn't anywhere else she can go. And she already trains at Sarasota half or half the year. And it just like makes sense to go there full time because where else would she go? 
I mean, yeah, I think this is a pretty easy swim. I think Brent has proven himself as a club coach. He developed Emma Wyant to a 2020 Olympic medal. He's now training Emma's younger sister, Gracie, who is a top commit who recently committed to Florida to join her sister, Emma. Um, so like Brent's been on multiple national team staffs. He obviously knows what he's doing. I think it's great for especially younger athletes to train with athletes their age. You know, I, I think I'm sure for summer training with those Canadian pros was a very valuable experience and a great learning opportunity. But I also think it's good for kids to be kids and for them to be around other high schoolers and just, uh, have that pressure of swimming taken off a little bit, um, just by being, by getting to be a normal kid. So, yeah, it's like, yes, the like question is like, oh, she's going from training with Canadian pros to high schoolers, but like she is a high schooler. So like it makes sense in that sense. Uh, I, I agree with you there. And last, but certainly not least, we'll keep it in Canada. The Toronto World <laughs> Cup kicks off tomorrow. Is Ledecky going to break a world record? That's the question we all came yeah. here for. Yeah. Sink or swim Ledecky world record. I feel like this is a slam dunk. Her long course times are like competitive with the top all time short course times. I, I just don't like I'm going to be disappointed if she doesn't break a world record. Pick an honest. event, Yin Yin. Pick an event. Which event? <laughs> I mean, is the 800 or the 1500 being swum this week? She's entered in 2 4 15. So I don't okay. know if the eight's being swum, but she's not swimming it if it is. Okay. She's going to break the 1500 world record by a lot. That's where you're going with. I'm going with the 400, okay? Because <laughs> now the target has been set, okay? And she has it in her sights. She was only, I think, two or three seconds off of Titmus's record before. I mean, so, and she hasn't swum it in forever. So, bottom line, she's, I think the 400 is in the bag. So, I'm swimming Ledecky, world record, 400 free, Sia Limbingji. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, she, she's probably going to break both if we're being honest. I'm sinking it. I just oh. don't. Oh. I, I Coleman think she'll Hodges get... toxic positivity sinking the most obvious positive answer. I didn't a, say the 1500. This... I said the 400. Okay, but. <laughs> That, well, that's the thing. It's it's just it's not obvious because we never <laughs> see her swim short course. True. Like she, we don't her know. First short her course four hundred free American record. So yes, but not world record. And I think she <laughs> can get. I think my prediction is that she will get very close to both world records in the four and the fifteen. But I don't think she'll break them because this is her. She doesn't swim short course meters. Uh, I think if she focused on it, absolutely. But I think I think she's going there to race. I think Florida has probably gone through Rocktober and she's super (laughs) tired. And we all know Ledecky throws down all the time. But I think she's just going to she's going to be just off world records. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Ledecky is going to watch this and break the world record just to prove you wrong. I would love it. <laughs> that would be an honor. Yeah. Bulletin board <laughs> material. Coleman Hodges says, I can't break the world record. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> All right. Well, that is our news for the week. This is the Swim Swam Breakdown. Tune in every week for your week's news in swimming.